It's good to be here. I bring you greetings from the United States of America and, um, and from heaven. I want to give honor to your pastor, Pastor Andrew and his lovely wife, and, I, um, and all the elders and pastors here, and also my brother, Pastor Alex, for um, inviting me. And I want to hear and share with you, I met your pastor 2019 when I came for the first time, and we connected. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Grant unto me your son and your slave supernatural divine utterance, that I may boldly make known the mysteries of the gospel. Grant unto your people the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they may know what is the hope of your calling, what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of your power towards them that believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Today I want to share with you, in light of Valentine's, um, the love of God. Everybody say the love of God. Uh, we know that love is a great mystery. Um, everyone is seeking love. I don't, I've never met a person that didn't want God's love, didn't want love in general. And we know that um, once you have the Lord, you have the love of God inside of you. There are many different aspects of love. C.S. Lewis um, has a book deal, dealing with the, the four loves. There's the affection, friendship, sexual love, and then agape, God's unconditional love. Uh, if anyone, if you were to ask anyone what love is, you would probably get a different answer based on the individual. And we know that um, based on the scriptures, that God has defined love for us out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Let me just remind you, love is kind, love is patient, love does not envy, love does not boast, love is not arrogant, it is not rude, it does not insist on its own way, love is not irritable, love is not resentful, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, love rejoices with the truth, love bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. Glory to God. And so my text is coming out of 1 John chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, I'm reading out of the ESV. 1 John chapter 4. The book of 1 John actually deals with love a lot. He's um, addressing the church because he's trying to get them to a place where, uh, to defending the faith, there were false prophets that were released into the church and they were denying the humanity of Christ. And so he's trying to let them know the importance of believing not only in Jesus' divinity, but also his humanity. And in the midst of that, he's focusing on love and believers walking in love. First John chapter four, verses, verse seven starts out. It says, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. The scripture tells us that we're loved by God. It, 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 it's a very unique word. It says be loved. That word be loved simply means to be loved by God. Uh, some believers haven't received or understand, I should say, how much God loves them. You, you, you're not just liked by God, but you're loved by God. God loves you. Say, God loves me. Not only does he loves me, but he likes me. God loves people, and God especially loves believers. There's a special love that God has for his church. Love, this be loved. It says, be loved. And then it turns around and says, let us love one another. It is through understanding the love of God or how much God loves us that empowers us to love one another. Sometimes people try to love within their own strength. But when you understand how much God loves you, it, it's an overflow of the love of God to other people. How I many know that ministry is the business of people? Ministry is about other people. One of the ways that we see from Philippians 2, we see that Paul is telling 
the church that I'm going to send Timothy, my son, in the faith to you, for there are others who have other interests, but Timothy has the interest of Jesus. And the interest of Jesus is loving people. Jesus loves people, and he's after people. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says that Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. Jesus had people on his mind. There's an old hymn that we sing in America called, when, I, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Jesus was thinking about humanity. He was, the, the Bible says that he, the son of God has come, the son of man has come to restore that which was lost. And what was lost was when Adam disobeyed God, there was a gap, there was a, um, a dis function that was a release of, of, of relationship between God and man. And Jesus is the mediator between God and man. And so here, the apostle John it says, let us love one another from love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God. How many know that we've been born of God? If you're a child of God and have received Jesus as your Lord and as your savior, you, you have been born of God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, What manner of love has the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God? We are children of God. He gave us his spirit, and therefore the Bible says in Romans 8 that our spirit cries, Abba, Father. Within our own selves, we are nothing. But with him, we, we are somebody. And Christ made us something. And I just want to submit to you that you are a big deal to God. Say this, say, I am a big deal to God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, and I know you all are preparing to get into Ephesians, it says that God, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has beforehand prepared for those who loved him. And so we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. I want to submit to you today that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, you are special, you are chosen, you are his inheritance, you are the light of the world. You're not just anybody, but you are special to God. And that you are God's child. One of the things that the enemy does to a lot of people, a lot of believers, is he's, he's, he gets them to believing that they are nothing and worthless to God. But how I many Jesus didn't die for, for his people, but he died for people. He died for people, and you are special in the eyes of God. And it, it would help you sometimes even to say that, I am God's special child. Just practice. Say, I am God's special child. I am his favorite child. Now, that might sound funny to your ears, but every one of us are special to God. We are his favorite because of Jesus. How many know that God really loves Jesus? And that Jesus is not just anybody to God. He it is his son. And the Bible says in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 25, says that God loves Jesus, God loves us just as much as he loves Jesus. And when you and I begin to see ourselves in Christ, then we will begin to love people the way God wants us to love. We are special to God. We are his inheritance. He has an inheritance in us. In Ephesians chapter 1, there's a prayer that I just prayed that we may know what, is the, what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints. In other words, we're praying that we may know how valuable we are to God. You're not just anything, but you are God's workmanship. And we should be very careful how we talk about his workmanship. You are fully known. You are the apple of his eye. You are a royal priesthood. You are somebody special. And David even said it. You are fearfully, wonderfully made. His, 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 his anger is but for a moment, 
but his favor is for a lifetime. So when God sees you, he doesn't see you outside of Christ. When you got born again, you put on Christ. And therefore, when God sees you, he sees you in Christ. You are the righteousness of God in him. Glory to God. The scripture tells us that we're, that we're those who love are born of God and they know God. If you really walking in that agape love, that unconditional love, you know God and you are born of God. People who are not born again, they do not know, they, they don't have the capacity to love. They have human love, but not the God kind of love. The God kind of love says, I'm going to love you regardless. That I, nothing you do, nothing you say is going to change my love. Human love is based on condition. I love you if you love me. I love you if you do this for me. I love you. Some people, they love people based on what people do for them. Some people love people based on what people look like. Some people love people based on how they are felt. Love is not a feeling, but love is a decision and it's a commitment that is followed by a corresponding action. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So love is a verb. It is an action. And the scripture tells us everyone who is from, love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God knows God. How can we love one another? Here's some suggestions, biblical suggestions from the Bible or commandments from the Bible. Speaking the truth in love. If you love somebody, you will tell them the truth. Come on. Love does not hold back or tell people what they want to hear, but love will tell a person when they're wrong. Also, love is listening. The Bible says in James to be slow to speak and quick to hear. And so one of the ways that we love people and love one another is when we listen to one another. Another way in which we love one another, and it's a really a high level of loving, a God's kind of way of loving, is when we pray for one another. Prayer, going to God on the behalf of somebody else for God to intervene in their lives. That is love. That's agape love. Another way that we love, according to Galatians, that we carry each other's burden. When we see our brothers and our sisters weighing down with financial burdens, weighing down with cares of the world, weighing down with grief, the Bible says weep with those that are weeping and rejoice with those that rejoice. So we should carry each other's burdens, and that is an expression of love. Meeting each other's needs. We see from the book of Acts how the earlier church, they met the needs of the church. And so we should look for opportunities to be a blessing. And the last that I want to submit to you is correcting one another. John says that we are to love one another because love is from God, if we love one another and walk in love, we, we know we are born of God and we know God. How do you know that you know God? How do you know that you are born of God? The very first thing that God does is he places his love in your spirit. Romans chapter 5 says, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And Ezekiel says that when we're born again, that God takes away our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. So the very first thing that God does when a person receives Christ, he puts his love in them. The scripture says in Galatians 5, it says that the fruit of the Spirit, it starts out with love. So the very fruit, that the first fruit that he puts inside the believer is love. It is the primary evidence of a person being born again. The scripture says in 1 John, it says that how do we know that we have passed from death to life when we have love for the brothers and sisters. And so God 
gives us a brand new heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says that if any man be in Christ, or any woman be in Christ, any person be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. And so God removes the hatred. He move, removes things that is in us that shouldn't be like him. He gives us a brand new nature. He gives us the commandment of love. As a child of God, the, you can't really say and really mean it with your heart that you hate somebody. You may say those words, but if you'll check on the inside of your spirit, you know that those words are not coming from you. If you really have God in your life, then you have love in your heart for humanity. And the measuring stick of how much I love God is not how much I praise him, not how much I come to church, not how much I give to the church or give to poor people, it's how much love I have for people. That is the primary measuring stick of how much I love God. You cannot separate your love for God from your love from your pe from people. There's times that people say, you know, there's a song by a popular gospel artist, and he's praying, Lord, deliver me from people. When you get born again, God delivers you to people, not from them. Come on. God gives you a heart for people. God gives you the reason, the Bible tells us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And guess what? For those who are married, the closest neighbor that you have is your spouse. It's amazing how some Christians, they're quick to love people they don't know, quick to forgive people they don't know, and, and quick to hold on unforgiveness to the people they, they live with. The greatest way to exercise the greatest love is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is with your family. And so God gives us this wonderful commission to love our spouse, love our kids, love our mom and dad and our sisters and brothers and cousins. That is the measuring stick of how much I know God. My time is getting away. Verse Eight says this, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. You cannot claim to know God and not walk in love. As we think about Valentine's, as we think about the world presenting love, they think love is a feeling. You ever seen people, they say, I'm in love. Well, how do you know you're in love? I got feelings. Well, how I many know those feelings will go away? Let that person get on your last nerve and the feelings goes out the door. So you can't base your love for people based on your feelings. You base your love on people based on what God's love for you. Understanding how much God loves you empowers you to love one another. And even as Ephesians, get ready to go through Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5 says that be dear imitators of God who God for Christ's sake forgave us let us love, forgive one another, and have a tender heart towards each other. So his love and his forgiveness empowers us to forgive our brothers and our sisters. Glory to God. How often should you forgive your brothers and your sisters? Jesus answered that. Seventy times seven over the same offense in one day. You forgive them like God forgives you. If God has forgiven you much, you forgive your brothers and your sisters. And you'll be surprised how many believers will hold unforgiveness. They will not forgive because what something somebody did to them. But how many know the greatest one who was offended is God with our sins? Let's go on verse 9. And this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we may live through him that we may live through him. How many know that God sent his only begotten son? The scripture tells us that God revealed to us his love. So God's love is not based on whether or not your prayers are answered. God's love for you is not based on whether the circumstances that you're in is favorable. But God's manifested love to us 
and for us is based on the cross. So whenever you're feeling like you're not loved by God, I want to encourage you to look at the cross. Don't look at based on a sign. Some people look for signs. God, if you love me, I pray that a red car goes by. That's not, that's not, it's going to happen. The devil will make sure a red car goes by or not go by. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't, I'm not really loved by God because a red car didn't go by. Or this prayer didn't get answered. That means he doesn't love me. But we, we don't base our understanding of how much God loves us, whether or not our prayers are answered, but we're based the love of God based on Jesus. So one of the things that we should do is baptize our minds on how much he loves us by looking at the cross. Isaiah 52 says that sin was placed upon Jesus and to such an extent that he didn't even look like a human being. Isaiah 53 says there was no beauty that we should behold him. And so as we look at the cross, we see the greatest expression of love, how Jesus became the ugly thing that we are so that we can become the beautiful thing that he is, which is a son of God. He called us friends and made us his child when we were enemies of God. At one point, you and I were, had fisted hearts towards God. And we were enemies of God. His wrath was upon us. And he was against us. And Jesus died in our place so that he could make us sons and daughters in the Son. So God's love for us is at the cross of Jesus. And that cross enables us to love one another. Verse 10 says, and this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The focus is not so much on how much we love God, but the focus is on how much God loves us. It's not that we love God first, but when we understood the cross and how he became sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. He became poor that we may become rich. He became sick that we may be whole, healed. He, he, became, he, he left the glories of heaven so that we can go into the glories of heaven. He took our name and placed our names in the Lamb's book of life and gave us his name. He was silent before the enemy so that we can say what the redemption that has taken place in our lives. The Bible boldly says, let the redeem of the Lord say so. And I end with this point that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. At one point, we were under the wrath of God, God's judgment. And Jesus delivered us from God's wrath and turned that wrath into the favor of God. The wrath of God was satisfied. Verse 11, my last scripture says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The foundation of our love for our brothers and our sister is God's love for us. When we allow ourselves to understand the love of God, there's a scripture that says, we have known and believed the love that he has for us. We have to believe that God loves us. No matter what you're facing, God loves you. Not only does he love you, he likes you. Understanding the love of God helps us to love each other. In Ephesians 3, it says that Paul is praying a prayer, verses 14 through 22. He says, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That lets us know that we should be bowing spiritually and physically to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on and says, of whom the whole family in heaven is named after. Guess, us, guess what? We're named after God. He put his name on us. He put his seal upon us. In Ephesians 1, he says, he sealed us with his spirit. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named after, that according to the riches of his glorious grace, 
that we may comprehend, that we may be strengthened with all might in our inner spirit, our inner man, that we may come to comprehend what is the breadth, the depth, the height, the length of the love of God, that we may know the love of God for his saints. Then he goes on, he says, that we may know the love of Christ, which passes our mere knowledge. God wants us to know and understand how much he loves us to the extent that we can wrap our mind around how great and how long and great, that, that love never ends. There's nothing that you can say or do to stop God from loving you. His love is unstoppable. Nothing you can say or do to get God to love you more. You will never be more loved than you are right now. Say, I am loved by God. Nothing can separate me from his love. Your circumstances can step you, separate you from his love. Your sin may separate you from fellowship, but doesn't separate you from his love. His love will never run out for you. Glory to God. Every eye closed, every hair bow. If you hear and you say, Pastor Dwayne, I don't know Jesus. I don't know the Savior. But I would like to give my life to Jesus. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to avoid. Today is a day of salvation. Today, why don't you receive his love in Christ? If you're here and you say, I don't know Jesus, but I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. I want to come to faith. I want you to be bold and brave enough to lift up your hands and say, that's me. I want to receive Jesus. Is there one? Is there one? Let's pray this prayer as believers. Say, Father God. Come on, say, Father God. I thank you for the love that you have for me in Christ. Nothing can separate me from your love. I believe that love. I believe you love me and I receive your love. Holy Spirit, help me to understand the love of God for me. Help me to comprehend how much he loves me that I may walk in this love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, KBC. May the Lord continue to cause his face to shine upon you. May you come to understand his love more and more each and every day. Whenever you're going through, whenever you're facing a challenge, don't judge God's love based on your challenges, but look at the cross and remember how much he loves you. God bless you.